I'm really excited about Pastor Joe's new uh, message series coming up. I, I think I expressed that last week, but it's apologetics, it's apologia, um, it's about defending, being able to defend your faith using scripture. Uh, I think that's vitally important. Uh, too many people are ill-prepared to uh, witness to other people because they don't know the word that well. Um, so it's kind of that being on your guard at all times. And also, um, you don't have to memorize it, but if you have one of these or on your phone and you're prepared to whip it open, you can definitely do that. And that's a win. This is your sword. This is your spiritual warfare sword. You need to have it with you. That's only a piece of the armor that you uh, are to put on daily. Um, so I want to begin this sermon as I was writing it. Um, some things happened uh, in my life that didn't affect me directly, but I was a part of. And one of those is uh, one of my good friends at work, uh, his 18-year-old son had passed away. Um, so it was unexpected. Um, he did have a history of seizures. And uh, one night he had a seizure, uh, was not able, was in a position where he aspirated and did not make it in the morning. Uh, so his parents found him. So I had to attend that. And it... Uh, it got me to thinking about, um, as Christians, sometimes we don't know exactly what we need to say or do with those people that are hurting in that situation. But I can tell you this, the more than anything you can say, your actions speak louder than words. Just being there and letting them know that you're there to support them and be there for them means more than anything you can say or do, especially... In, that soon after after that happened. Um, so that will have uh, some bearing on my message later on this morning, but uh, I wanted you to know when I get into the message later on where I'm, where I'm uh, coming from on that. Um, to start off, let's, uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, come to you this morning, Lord. One with a thankful heart that we get to know your grace and mercy on a daily basis. But Lord, also that we have a choice, that we have free will. We're thankful that we can have a choice to, to have life or to not have life, Lord. That is our choice. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit again just moves in this room so that the words that I speak today are words of truth, your words, Father. And that they will hear them and know where they are coming from. Not from Greg Fuller, but from you. Lord, I pray that these words will speak to those who need to hear them today. And Lord, that everyone will be able to place those words in their heart. So that they, when they leave here today, Lord, that they can use them when they reach out to others. Lord, it's in your son's mighty name, King Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so to kick off, I want to start out uh, in Romans. So if everybody will get your word out, we're going to go to Romans chapter 6. And my, uh, my Bible looks like it grew a bunch of papers, so those are my marks there, tabs. Uh, so chapter 6, we're going to verses 15 through 23. And this is, again, Paul speaking, and he says this. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves um, to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teachings that has now claimed you, your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. 
I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human in, uh, limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to every increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things, are, those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Uh, so the title of my sermon today is The Wages of Sin, as uh, Paul so eloquently put it. Um, he basically said that we have two choices in this life. We can choose life or we can choose death. He didn't say God picks which one you have. He says you choose which one. So it's very interesting to note that when we talk to other people and they say, how can a loving God do this? How can a loving God do that? You have to put that into play. God doesn't make you do anything. He gives you a way out of your mess. You have to choose to take that. Paul points out that you are, you are a slave of your choosing. You choose to either sin or to not sin. So you choose death or you choose righteousness. If you remember, one of the things that I mentioned last Sunday was that all of us were created to worship and love. And then we kind of examined um, our pocketbooks and our calendars to kind of figure out what those things were. The free will that we have allows us to choose what we worship what we worship and love. And that is why Paul is making sure that everyone reading his letter understands that your choice has a direct effect on where you spend eternity, life or death. So in the spiritual warfare realm, Satan makes it all too clear what he wants you to choose. The world screams it in everything you look at or everywhere you go. He would like you to make sin your choice because it separates you from God. That's what sin does. Sin is a rebellion from what God commands. And if you rebel from God, you're separated from him. And that's what he does. He deceives, he distorts, and he separates. Because he knows that if he can do that, and have you on your own, have him, you to himself, that he can talk to you in your mind, get in there, and uh, point you in the wrong direction. I kind of mentioned that last week in my testimony, how I was rapidly going down the, the uh, path of pornography, and how in, our, in my mind I could justify that. That is not only... Uh, a uh, product of free will, but it's also a product of that knowledge of good and evil. See, when Eve ate from that tree and gave it to, to Adam also, that just didn't mean that we knew right from wrong. That meant we got to choose, we had the wisdom to choose what is evil, what is good, which is not, <laughs> not does not align with what God has for good or evil. So if we can justify in our heads, hey, this isn't that bad, this, this is all right, this is good, that we tend to fall down that, that line. But just know that if we reflect on our own knowledge and not on the words that are in this book, the truth, it's very easy to head down the, the path to death, the path of sin. So another tactic that the enemy likes to use is to um, distort scripture, right? That's right. He, can take, he can take a verse and he can change it slightly so it sounds right. 
but it's going to lead you down the wrong path. Um, we can kind of see that tactic early on with Adam and Eve. It's, I have to remember, because this is so plentiful and such a, an easy resource to have, you have to remember Adam and Eve did not have this. They were living the Old Testament. They didn't have the Old Testament with them. They were living it. So, like, when Satan tempted Eve in the garden, it's easy for us to go back, did God really say that? And we go back and look, oh, no, he didn't say that. Um, but Eve and Adam didn't have that. They had just their recollection right there. They were living that out. So I want to kind of take a look at that tactic from Satan. So if you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. And this is where the fall happens of mankind. And in the very first verse, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Hmm. Well, we have the, uh, the luxury of going back chapter 2 to see what really he really did say. So if you turn to chapter 2, verse 16, we can read what God really said. God said, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So that's what God said. So Satan comes out and says, did he really say don't eat from any tree? No, that's not what God said at all. <clears throat> if we read on uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, you'll see Eve's response. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit, uh, eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it, or you will die. So, in, in God's commandment to Adam, which then got passed on to Eve, it was so important for them not to eat the fruit that they put it in their heads. We're not even to touch the fruit. We don't even want to touch that stuff. It is bad. God said, don't do it. We don't want to do it. But the serpent comes along. And he tempts them by distorting what God had said and asking them questions. So if we go back to uh, Genesis 2, verse 17, we'll take a look here. Um, and, and I read that already. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. That's what was really said. So he had laid plans for the fall, for, for the separation. He was distorting. He was deceiving. He was doing everything that Satan does. He was reusing those tactics. So he's like, did God really say, when, it, when you hear those phrases, there's one place you need to run to, and that's right here. What did God really say? So we talked about it in my men's classroom this uh, study the grow group this morning about how interesting it was that they put in there God didn't tell them but they put in there don't even touch it or you will die but they ate it she ate it how did that happen how did it go from don't touch this to oh yeah that looks good that does look good I think I'll eat it it wasn't from anything that God said it, it was from what Satan had said, because he had told them that if you eat from that tree, you will not die. Surely you will not die, but you will be like God. You will know wisdom. You will know good and evil. That's when Eve took a look at that tree and said, hmm, that fruit does look pretty good. I think I might try that. 
It wasn't until the appealing, the appealment of the wisdom you can gain from that tree, that's when she decided, let's try this. And so she ate, and then what happened? She gave it to Adam, and he ate. And it says he was there. Adam was there, but the serpent didn't talk to Adam. He talked to Eve. So why did Adam just let all this carry on? God was the one that gave Adam the commandment. Adam passed that on to Eve. Yet the serpent wasn't talking to Adam. Nor did Adam speak up and say, no, we are not to eat from that. That's not what God commanded us. So one of the things I wanted to point out was the tactics that, that Satan does use. And he does not only just use it from himself for himself. If you see a talking serpent, you might say, hey, that's a little weird. I don't think I want to talk to this guy. But he does use people. And so he can use people to come to you and distort scripture. By knowing this tactic and being able to guard against it, by knowing the truth, reading scriptures, to be able to know when the truth is being distorted by reciting the truth as it is written, you will be able to defend not only the truth, but dismantle the tactic for use on those around you. Not only for you can you protect it, but those who are, who are around you that are also being tempted. That's why I think apologic, apologetics and apologia is so interesting and so vital. So, Satan thought, man, these tactics are working. This is going great. So when God sends Jesus to earth to be the, the sacrificial, sacrificial lamb for our sins, Jesus goes out to the wilderness fasting. And Satan thought, hmm, let me use these tactics on Jesus. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, we'll take a look at this account. Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 4. And it says this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So where did he get that? Where did Satan get that from? If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. It's scripture. It's from the Old Testament. Matter of fact, if you look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, take a look at that real quick. You'll see exactly where he got that. says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then fed you with manna, which neither you nor the ancestors had known, to teach, that, that you, that, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So what did Jesus come back with? What was his, what was his remark back to, to Satan? He came back with the scripture, right? He came back with Deuteronomy. Eight, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 3, he said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right? He came back. And I think at that point, Satan's like, hmm, okay. This isn't working out like it did before. So let me try this again. So then, uh, if you read further on, Matthew 4, verses 5 through 7, it says, the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Then Jesus replied to him with what again? Scripture, the truth. 
It is also written, he says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So Satan came at him with Psalms 91, Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. We can see what it says there. Psalm 91, 11 through 12 says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Wow, Satan knew scripture, knew it word for word, and tried to use it against Jesus. But Jesus came back with Deuteronomy 6, 16. Flipping through, sorry. It's just interesting to me that he doesn't just say things just to say them. He uses the very scriptures that we have. So 6.16 says, get there, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did in Massa. So he is quoting scripture. Uh, so then that's strike two for Satan. So then he decides to go on if we look at uh, Matthew 4 verses 8 through 11. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Then Jesus replied back to him with Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I thought it was kind of interesting that Jesus, who is known as the Word, as the Word, is being tempted with the Word from Satan. That's right. Kind of a self-defeating tactic, I would think. Um, if you're going to, to tempt somebody and distort truth using Scripture, I don't think you should go to the one whose very nature is the Scripture, who knows every word that's in this book. Probably a bad plan. So, as I told you, this is a good reason to get excited for Pastor Joe's upcoming messages. Because you can do that. You can take scripture, and when somebody comes at you and says, well, doesn't it say this in the Bible? It says this. And you say, yeah, it says that, but it also says this. Because false prophets often do have a tactic as well. They'll take one verse and use it to, um, to fulfill whatever it is that they want you to know or what they want you to understand. Instead of reading the whole thing in context and getting the real message behind what that verse says. It's a very common tactic. Some of those distorted truths have already been, have found themselves ingrained in some Christian denominations by using world views in their theology and ideology. The world which is being largely led by sin has unleashed into the world at the hands of the enemy. Uh, the fallen world wants you to invest all your time in emotions and not bother learning behaviors that are far more satisfying and good for your soul. So, for instance, the world wants you to seek happiness. Forever happiness. Have happiness for the rest of your life. Is that doable? Can you be happy the rest of your life? Think about that. Can you be happy the rest of your life? It's emotion. It's fleeting. Happiness is fleeting. Um, you cannot continually have happiness. It's not, it's not um, obtainable. But what you can have is the behavior of joy. Joy is something that's a behavior that you learn and you can have forever. Some, and the world wants, you, wants to confuse you. Happiness and joy mean the same thing. It doesn't. You can have joy, and, and James talks about this. You can have joy in your temptation, in your trials and tribulations. What? Joy, because why do you have joy? 
Because you have Christ. Christ gives you hope. That's faith. Faith in Christ gives you hope and gives you joy. It doesn't mean that you're happy that you're going through the trials. I'm not happy when I go through trials. I'm not happy when, when God is, is disciplining me. But I have joy knowing that he cares enough for me that he doesn't want me to fall into any other traps. So he is disciplining me. That means I'm worth it. That's reason to give joy. If you turn to uh, Galatians 5.22, we'll take a look at this, and I think some of you will notice it right away. That is the verse for the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those are the behaviors. If you have the fruit of the Spirit, you have those things. Those are the behaviors that you learn and can have the rest of your life. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, says this, and this is what I alluded to earlier. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, or perseverance. Right? It's not joyful to be tempted. You're not happy to be tempted or trials, but you can have joy because you have Jesus. What about love? What about love? Did they make that a song? Yeah. What about love? Is it an emotion or is it a learned behavior? Both. What does the world tell you that love is? It's an emotion, right? How many have heard this from, from a couple who just got divorced? Oh, we, we kind of fell out of love, right? Can you fall out of love, real true love, the love that God has for you? You can't. What they're really saying is, I don't feel the same way that I did about that person when we first met. It's a feeling. It's emotion. Are you going to feel about somebody the same today, tomorrow, in a few years from now? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. You're, you're two different individuals. You have different backgrounds. You have different ways of thinking, different ways of, of living. Something's going to not mesh. So you're not going to have those lovey-dovey, hearts in your eyes type feelings for that person every day. Just ask my wife, she knows. <laughs> so when the world tells you there's love, they're talking about the emotion, love. And that's very far from what God wants you to have. So let's look at what God says love is. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records, record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes always preserves. Does that sound like an emotion, a feeling to you? I often have to look at things before I can say I love them now. I get convicted of this. Or if I'm having an argument with my significant other, which happens very rarely. Um, the things that I say I have to guard against the things that I do I have to guard against. Because I look at 1 Corinthians 13, I'm like, is that kind? What I'm about to say to this person, love is kind. 
and I love this person, is what I'm about to say kind? Am, am I about to boast because I'm right and they're wrong, which happens a lot? Just ask her. <laughs> that's not love. So that's a learned thing. That's something I have to look at all the time and, and balance that or put that up against what my definition of love is. And then I'm often wrong. So when you say to your significant other that you love them, we're saying we mean the kind of love from those verses in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Are we saying that or are we saying we have a feeling that we attribute to love? Evil wants to diminish one of the strongest attributes that God has given us by using the emotion of lust and sexual acts. Can that be attributed to love in today's view, in the world's view? Most certainly. So it's made love dirty at some point, and people want to stay away from that. Uh, child abuse, spousal abuse, all those things diminish the real true meaning of love. As Christians, we need to make sure that the true meaning of love is used when dealing with the world so that they get a glimpse of what true love truly is. So why is it that people of this fallen world, many of who claim, to not, uh, claim not to know God or believe in his existence, all of a sudden point a finger to God when they experience the loss of a loved one and claim, you did this, God. I thought you were loving. How could you let this happen? Blaming God for, for the death of their loved one. But the very nature of God is love. And so that made me go back and, and look at, did God create death? Did he cause that person to die? And that's where my message came in, the wages of sin. Sin causes death. It tells us that at the very beginning. You will die on this, in this life. You will die. That's what sin does. God didn't do that. God didn't say, okay, guys, here's sin. We did that. We said, that looks pretty desirable and pretty tasty. We want to we wanna do some of that. We brought sin into the world. And because we brought sin into the world, we also brought death into the world. So can we, as people, point our fingers to God and say, why did you do this? Why is this person dead? Not, we should be pointing them at ourselves. Why did we do that? Why did, why did we bring sin into the world? So in that, that brought me full circle back to Genesis 3, chapter 3, with the fall of man. God tells them directly in chapter 2 that if they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that they would die. That would mean that if they did not eat from the tree, that they would live, right? So who actually brought death into the world? In, in conclusion, this means that man brought death into the world by his act of defiance against God. And as I mentioned earlier with my friend's uh, son's uh, sudden passing, I often wonder what the best way is to behave around somebody that suffered a loss like my friend. The Christian side of me wants to make sure that they know that there is life after this one an eternal life with God, and I can tell them how that can happen, to give hope to a situation that seems hopeless. But I also understand that as a Christian, I should be showing the love of Jesus during a time of mourning, a love that is patient and kind, to mourn with them. 
Even Jesus wept with Martha and the other Jews at the tomb of Lazarus. So, I'm going to invite the worship team back up as I give you my summary. You have two choices in this life while you're here on this planet that's going to affect your eternity. You can choose Jesus as a savior and live life for eternity. Or you can choose sin and not Jesus and choose an eternity of death. Because the wages of sin is death. It says that very clearly. So what will your choice be? If your plan is to wait and see what happens before you make a decision, I would tell you now that there is a fatal flaw in that plan. We are not promised another day on this earth. You will die. You have a choice to choose eternal life or eternal death. If that is you today, then I beg you to pray to your Savior during this last song. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and repent. Let him know that you believe with all of your being that he is the son of God and that he came to earth as a man and was wrongfully convicted and paid for all of the world's sins with his life and then was resurrected on the third day and is now sitting on the right hand of the Father. Ask him to be Lord of your life and transform you into a new person with hope of eternal life. If you believe that, then I say pray it. If Jesus is already your Lord and Savior, but you are struggling with the sin that has you imprisoned, you want to be set free then during this last song, you need to invite the Lord back into your life and take his rightful place on the throne of your heart. You may not have the power to overcome that sin, but King Jesus does. Let him back into your heart. For the rest that are hearing my voice and don't, and don't fit into either one of those categories, then during this last song, you need to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ that are dealing with sin. Pray for those that don't hear us now but need to know about the wages of sin. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue our worship this morning, Lord, there are those out there that are suffering, some who don't even know your name. And Lord, for those, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just take hold of them and they would get wind of who you really are. You are life, Jesus. In this life, we will surely die. But after this life, we can live in eternity. But we can't do that without you. There's no hope of saving for what we've done, the sins that we've committed. Only you can forgive those sins, Lord. And I pray for those who may have wandered away. I pray that they come back to you and understand that even though they've made a mistake that it doesn't keep them from you all they have to do is admit that it was a mistake ask for your forgiveness and you'll receive them right back into the fold Lord that they never lost eternity of life life eternally but Lord they've, they've surely tested it out Bring them back. Let them see that they don't have the power to save themselves. Only you have that power. Lord, I just pray as we walk out these doors today that you give us the knowledge and the word to talk to those around us, to talk those, to those who are hurting. And Lord, to be bright, shining beacons that points directly to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Hey, I hope that you've been blessed by this word, encouraged or challenged in some kind of way. If you are joining us for the first time, remember that the experience does not end here. I want to invite you to visit lifesongfamily.org slash connect and fill out that digital connect card so we can get to know you better and find out how we can serve you and your family better here at Lifesong Family Church. Of course, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter as well so you can keep up with everything that is happening here at Lifesong Family Church. And as always, as you are able, we invite you to join us in person right here in Lewisburg, Tennessee. We can't wait to see you.